So hi, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Expert. Today, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Ares Dror. Um, a short bio on him, Dr. Dror completed his doctoral studies at the laboratory of Mark Donat at the University of Basel, Switzerland. He investigated the role of postprandial inflammatory response in glucose homeostasis. Later, he became interested in the molecular underpinning that defines cell types and started his postdoc research in Andrew Pospisilic's group at the Max Planck Institute for Immunobiology and Epigenetics in Germany. There, he developed a method in order to study a novel epigenetic heterogeneity in beta cells called ScanSeq. This resulted with the identification of two novel beta cell subsets with specific epigenetic rewiring in which he will be presenting about today. Um, additionally, his next goal is to establish his own research group that will utilize ScanSeq in order to study intra-cell-cell -cell interactions with the pancreatic islets and within other metabolic tissues such as adipose, liver, and the brain. So welcome. Um, Dr. Dror, you can take it away. Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about the postdoc project um, that actually um, asked the question how we could leverage a specific heterogeneity, epigenetic heterogeneity that we have identified uh, to uh, actually reveal two bona fide beta cell subtypes. Um, and before I start to answer this question, um, I will first ask the question, the more general question, what is a cell type? And apparently for decades, we've been utilizing um, different approaches and we've been class classifying cells by their morphology, uh, either nuclear or cytological epigenome configuration, transcriptome output, cell surface protein expression, as we know in immune cells, for example, and of course their function. In, in that sense, we also do it within the islet. We all know the insulin producing beta cells, glucagon producing alpha cells, uh, somatostatin producing delta cells, and so on. So within the islets, we know of different cell types. And the beta cell um, is a very uh, unique cell. It's uh, highly specialized. We all know here in this audience that these are the only cells in our body that produce and secrete insulin in response to glucose. So they are very important. They are quiescent. They rarely proliferate. Something like 0.5% are actively proliferating when uh, assayed for uh, proliferative marks such as KI67. They have a rather low plasticity compared to other cells of the islet. And they are considered a homogeneous population. And so far, we've had only one accepted beta cell type but it's not because heterogeneity doesn't exist. So there are multiple factors that affect beta cell heterogeneity. Either the development of the, of the um, organism, aging, stress affects heterogeneity, and of course, transcriptional bursts. And we have recently um, also um, showed that beta cell of the insulin I can also tell you that these are not senescent cells. Um, in addition, uh, for, for the islet crowd, we could identify these cells in all islets, whether they are small or big. Um, we could identify it in males and females. And may, maybe some of you may know that K27 trimethylation is also silencing uh, um, the X chromosome in the female. We didn't see any effect uh, on, on the sealing of the X chromosome. Uh, this you could see here in this small shiny uh, dots that are within uh, the nucleus. These are the, the uh, so-called uh, bar bodies. These are not affected. So we have a specific relation, probably autosomal. All right, and when we look closer um, with high resolution, what we saw is first thing, we could quantify also uh, the, the size and the volume of the nuclei. And I can tell you that the cells with the higher levels of K27 trimethylation are small, uh, the nuclei are smaller. Also the cells, this I will tell you um, as well, because we have the parameters from the facts as well. But what's important here that um, 
um, in agreement with what is known of compacted nuclei uh, that are uh, also um, have more uh, silencing in the chromatin, the nuclei are smaller. So we have differences in the morphology, but it's not only the size, but also the distribution of the mark. Um, typically, silencing uh, of, um, of genes and K27 trimethyl specifically is in the uh, nuclear periphery. And that's what we see in, in the cells that are with a lower um, amount, um, amount of uh, K27 trimethyl. Um, and in the high cells, we see this appearance of central domains that are in the core of where usually uh, um, uh, there is active uh, transcription. We could quantify this in multiple cells and also validate uh, uh, this result for chip seq. So we did K27 parametrization um, chip sequencing, and we indeed saw that beta cells are high or low. Uh, these high and low beta cells also split uh, on the first principal component according to the levels of K27 by fax. So, so far we hit uh, two out, out of um, um, these five defining criteria. We have different morphology, different epigenome. And um, of course, we next wanted to see what happens um, with, uh, with the transcription, cell surface marker, and each of the other defining criteria. But what I also want to stress out is that these beta cells are not different uh, cell types. Uh, so to say, if you look just at a landscape, so these are very small changes, but significant changes. So if we look at the, of, of the markers, such as um, Hox genes that are typically silenced by K27 trimethyl, these are still unchanged between the high and the low. And they're exactly the same as in within the whole island. Um, same if we look at the uh, insulin gene and the IGF, IGF2 that is uh, silenced. So they, they have beta cell epigenome, so to say. So what are these differences? The differences are in uh, the different compartments of what we uh, believed to be either active uh, or silent in the whole, when we looked at the whole, or whole island, sorry. So the gene bodies of the high cells were um, majority annotated as active. And the gene bodies of the low cells that were specifically in the low cells they were what we knew to be as silent. So we can also say, in other words, we have this silencing of what we thought are silent when we looked at the bulk population that is being represented by the majority of the cells that are the low cells. But it's not only that, it's also uh, um, uh, the, um, how broad these peaks were when we call the specific peaks and um, the, the peaks of the beta high also in agreement with the higher levels uh, that we see by fax, um, they are uh, broader. So in order to um, assess differences in the transcription, um, we took two approaches. One of them uh, was the unbiased approach, which I will talk in this slide, but we also wanted the, the unbiased approach. Um, um, and that was uh, by utilizing bulk RNA sequencing. But first things first, I wanted uh, to address this question, and uh, the best uh, um, is to um, apply single cell RNA sequencing. Um, but I could also couple this single cell RNA sequencing um, and uh, in order to do clustering, but also be able to project levels of K27 primitive and see whether we have uh, whether the clusters that we get that are based upon the transcriptome also. Uh, uh, represent the high and low cells. So I will explain. We take um, our cells, fix them, or fre freshly fixed. Um, we, are, we control, these are only the, the, what used to be viable cells because they're also stand for a fixable viability dye. And it's a technical but important detail. So these are freshly fixed. We have no stress in uh, signature in these cells. They are stained for surface markers. They're stained, they're then permeabilized stain for um, intracellular, either cytoplasmic and nuclear antibody labeling, and hence the name surface cytoplasmic and nuclear antibody labeling that is coupled with single cell RNA sequencing. And we called it ScanSync. And this allows um, uh, the quantification of cell surface marker, all the markers that we can think of, 
and then also uh, the transcription um, of the different clusters that we identify. So I stand for insulin, K27 trimethyl, and we have also parameters such as size and granularity, thanks to the uh, forward and side scatter uh, from the fax. So indeed, we got two major clusters. Here are one and two. And you will see that when we project the levels for every cell that we know, um, uh, thanks to the uh, index sorting, we see that the K27 trimethyl high cells are all localized within or enriched within cluster number one. This is um, also with all the limitation of single cell RNA seq. When we know we just scrape the tip of the iceberg, we still get this separation. Important note here is that um, what we see is also that insulin at the RNA level are not representing insulin at the protein level. So that's another nice feature that we can uh, utilize with the scan seq. And I hope you can appreciate that the, the high cells, they have higher levels of K27 trimethyl. These are the cells from individual mice. Uh, they have higher levels of insulin at the protein levels. They are smaller. And if we just look at them by RNA sequencing, we think they are uh, as so-called immature cells or, or um, with the lower levels of insulin um, according to their gene expression. And <laughs> In concordance to this result, what we see, and so in agreement with what we saw in the chip seek, where we have this desilencing of what we believed uh, to be uh, silent genes, we indeed see that the cluster of, of uh, um, the high cells also have higher expression of genes that are typically silenced, um, with it, which we call and refer to as bivalent genes that are marked with K27 trimethyl, but also with an active mark which upon release, upon, uh, release and reduction in K27 trimethyl levels, we have expression of, of these genes, these, are, these bivalent, bivalent genes ready to be activated. And we see it not only in our uh, data set, but in every other data set uh, that we did this uh, meta-analysis in, in mice, but also um, in humans. So we have this uh, trajectory of, of K27 trimethyl mark genes that are uh, slowly being um, increased or decreased depending how you look at it, but it's always there. We always have these projections. But it's not only the RNA sequencing, we also see it in a taxic uh, data sets, published data sets. And this is also true when we look uh, at bulk populations, when I sort uh, with, with the um, higher numbers of beta high or beta low uh, for deep uh, RNA sequencing, we see the same in per so here you see in red and purple, these are the differently expressed genes. And I hope you could also appreciate that the genes that are um, annotated as typically silent uh, in the whole islet in the bug population are actually uh, upregulated in beta high cells. So this is again in agreement with our single cell data set and the chip six cell data set. So what are these genes? Um, here you can see just a principal component analysis. Again, we have a separation of beta high and beta low, also at a deep RNA um, sequencing just for the quality. These are the heat maps of the individual um, samples. And here you see a cytoscape a plot of, of the, uh, the um, go term analysis from these differently expressed genes. And that was uh, quite neat to see, but one of the first hit or the first hit we got are histone modifications that is enriched in, in beta high cells. So these were histone modifiers that I will tell you about in a second, but we also saw some enrichments of mitochondria genes or Oxford genes um, that are within the beta low, which I will also elaborate. So what are these histone modifiers? Um, so that's, that was another confirmation, uh, but it was uh, nice to see that um, the histone modifiers are actually that um, several of them, but two key uh, K27 trimethylation or, or demethylation. So the uh, EZH2 that is responsible for depositing this very same specific mark or uh, KDM6B, which is encoding for JMJD3 that is responsible for the removal of this mark were both upregulated in beta high cells. When we looked at um, beta cell mature transcription factors, we didn't see any differences uh, either um, 
uh, also, excuse, excuse me, also not when we check for immaturity uh, markers such as uh, uh, the, the fl uh, flat top or CD81. Um, so these are to us bona fide beta cells. But what we did see is that UCN was enriched in the beta low, we were quoting three, and RFX6 was enriched in the beta high. And when we looked at the genes that are upregulated and did um, uh, Homer enrichment analysis, we saw that um, the enhancer, uh, the, the, the this, um, that these are actually enriched for RFX6. So um, these, these results actually complement uh, the upregulation in the expression. And again, I just want to stress, we validated that um, in, in multiple samples. Beta high have more insulin at protein level. So these are bona fide, I once again say bona fide beta cells, and they are um, as seen mature beta cells. All right, so what are the differences um, on the mitochondrial side? That's what we uh, saw. And uh, actually, there was another publication uh, that uh, reported back in uh, 2021 about the decoupling of, of mitochondrial encoded and nuclear encoded uh, gene expression, and in and specifically also in beta cells. And that's what we saw also in our uh, two cell types. So beta high cells, they had increased expression of mitochondrial encoded, um, mitochondrial encoded uh, RNA and uh, the beta low had increased expression of nuclear encoded uh, related RNA. So all these in the DUFA um, uh, genes. So we have differences in morphology, epigenome, transcriptome, and um, what about the cell surface marker? That was the, the next question. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, so we, we wanted also to know what about surface marker and, and the function. But first, I also want to tell you that um, we validated um, this uh, not only by, by uh, the RNA, so we also validated by mitochondrial content, the results we got from the RNA. So mitochondrial content is uh, higher in, in beta high cells. So we see it either by quantification of the DNA or of the um, mitochondrial protein TOM20, and they also have a different size and shape. So there are indeed two unique cell types. So what about the cell surface marker? Um, so what I want to show you here, one of the, of the um, upregulated cell surface marker was uh, CD24. Now CD24 is typically um, um, used ever since uh, I think three years ago to sort uh, also delta cells. And um, it is highly expressed in delta cells. And so are other uh, markers that you see here. So we validated these. We know that um, uh, at the protein levels, we don't see these differences um, in the other hormones uh, such as uh, glucagon, uh, somatostatin um, and, and so on, PPY, these are negative for that. Um, but if we looked at the ChIP-seq data, CD24A is also desilenced in the beta high cells. So this is also in agreement with what you see uh, at the transcriptome. And if we look at the protein level, if by imaging, uh, indeed, beta cells are either positive or negative for CD24. And if we couple this with the staining of K27 trimethyl, we see that the, here in the, in the scatter plot, that the beta cells that are higher for K27 trimethyl, if we also stain for CD24, they're uh, kind of double positive. We could also project it uh, to our ScanSeq um, UMAP uh, to show that CD24 positive cells, these are insulin positive, somatostatin negative cells are indeed um, cluster in cluster number one that are K27 chromatin high. So we have a cell surface marker, but another very important point to stress out here is that the levels of CD24 are not close to the levels of CD24 that are in delta cells. So this demanded a, a very precise antibody titration. And I hope you can appreciate here yeah, these shiny white cells that are also negative for insulin. These are, these are the levels of CD24, and these are the levels of CD24 in the beta cells. 
So it can easily be overlooked. So it needs really careful antibody titrations. So now that we are equipped with, with a membranous marker, we could sort these cells. Um, and indeed, we also, when they're alive, we can also measure um, things like membrane potential of mitochondria. So they also have uh, increased mitochondria uh, membrane potential. And when we aggregate these cells into pseudo islets, pseudo monotypic islets, we can also do functional analysis um, and also assess stability, which is very important. So this I will address in the, in the next slide. In these monotypic uh, um, pseudo islets, uh, at least for a week under standard culturing conditions, these are stable. So according to their transcriptomes, but not only. Also according to their expression of CD24 that we could reanalyze by fax, as you can see in these two plots here. There are still different uh, levels of insulin at the RNA. Uh, RFS6 is enriched in the highs, so does mitochondrial genes. And this is one week of uh, uh, culturing of monotypic islets. So we have kind of st stability. And what about their function? Uh, we could do single, uh, single spheroid um, uh, um, metabolic assay. So this is the seahorse. If you're familiar with it, we can measure, we can assess uh, oxidative phosphorylation by the oxygen uh, consumption rate, which is the OCR, or the extracellular acidification rate, which um, measure um, basically lactic acid, acid production. So glycolysis versus um, oxidative phosphorylation. Beta high cells, they have a different metabolic profile. They react stronger to the same glucose levels. And they also secrete more insulin um, upon the, uh, the same glucose levels. So this is also functional um, outcome of this. Chronically, beta low cells secrete more. So in the baseline, if you just have cells, uh, the monotypic islet in culture, they secrete chronically more. All right, so we hit the, the checkbox of each of these defining criteria. Uh, um, I hope I could convince, uh, and that, that, that's the summary slide now, that we actually have two, uh, the beta cells are found either as K27 traumatic low or high, that are also um, uh, different by their nuclear organization, uh, the cell size, their epigenomes, transcriptomes, mitochondrial content, and importantly, insulin secretion. Um, what is CD24 doing there? That's something for the future. Um, and we have a battery of experiments that we are going to address that. But what about the human conservation? And what happens under metabolic stress to these two cells? Um, so I can superficially answer that the beta high and low are conserved in humans according to stainings of K27 trimethyl and CD24, as you can see. So this mimics the image we see in the mice. And I just have also to stress out here, we have extreme variability because these are human samples and we saw um, effect and enrichment of one type or the other, uh, depending on the shipment time. So this is also a caveat here. But we could also um, identify our two cell types uh, within other data sets, like one of the biggest um, data sets of, of, um, that is out there, the patch seek that was published by Pat McDonald's lab in Sam Metabolism a couple of years ago. And we could uh, also show that both cell types um, react um, upon stress and that there is an enrichment of one of the types that is better high like um, in, in uh, type two diabetic. And uh, when we uh, validate this in, in mice models, uh, so high fat diet, it's not really uh, diabetes, but we see the same trend. We have enrichment of, of beta high cells uh, in metabolically um, stressed mice. So this could be either because uh, we have differences in cell type expansion, either one cell type is resistant to the diabetic, diabetic milieu uh, or whether we have a cell type conversion. And these are things that we will also address um, in the future experiments that we have planned. So what I can just tell you by the outlook, that's uh, part of the tools that we can uh, utilize. We have um, genetic tools and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, pharmacologically uh, treatments. We can manipulate uh, the ratios of these two uh, simply by um, haploinsufficiency uh, of 
uh, either one of the two uh, very important histone modifiers for K27, uh, that is either EED, that results with, with increased um, beta high cells, increased ratio of beta high cells uh, um, compared to beta low, or on the other side, the JMJD3, which is the demethylase, uh, we see reduction in, in the ratio. So we can really play with this. So this, is, this is the first model for such, uh, for such approach. And uh, we also see the same when we uh, treat in vitro, we can uh, manipulate K27 traumatic levels in beta cells, and these are not proliferating cells. So this really suggests that we can, uh, in quiescent cells, affect the chromatin. And, um, and possibly also we could uh, utilize this for uh, stem cell derived diets and maybe generate uh, a favoring one type over the other, and one could be better uh, transplanted, for example. So that's it. That's my, uh, my last slide, very important slide, acknowledgement slide. Of course, I would like to uh, thank Andrew uh, for letting me stay here. Actually, our story is a bit complicated. I'm here uh, quite alone, but I got all the support uh, from Michigan. I'm in Germany. So it was a very, it, it, it was and it still is a pleasure to work with him. These are all the people that contributed um, um, the story, um, our collaborators. And I would really like to thank you uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you for sharing very exciting work. Um, if anyone has any questions, please unmute and share or drop in the chat and I can read it out. Hi, Neha, it's Alexis Karmer. Um, thanks, Erez, that was a great presentation, very interesting. Um, after that and looking at your paper, I, I did, um, the first question I had was, um, I'm wondering if you could just describe that the population that you analyzed that were human islets, I think it was from Alberta. Um, and I know you mentioned there there was some type two population. I don't think there was any type one. And could you tell us a little bit about your hypothesis for studying this in type one? Yeah, so in type one, it's a, it's a good question. So in the, in the um, McDonald paper, there are very few type one cells, so we couldn't say anything uh, uh, concrete. But for type one, if we look at the other models, um, the CD24 positive cells are highly enriched. So in every model that we look at uh, of type one diabetes, we see enrichment of, of uh, these beta high cells. And what, we, what I believe is that these are immune evading cells. So in the context of type one diabetes, but that's, uh, that's my goal for the, the future as well, like really expand and the communication between immune cells uh, to the different cell types. Uh, I had a question as well, uh, Matt Wortham, UC San Diego. It was a really nice talk, and congrats on the excellent paper. Uh, so uh, I was curious about your uh, facts quantification of the different histone modifications. Um, two questions, I guess, is one is, how much is this dependent upon the, the breadth or the abundance of each modification in the genome? Um, is there something about HRK27 trimethylation that just makes it more likely to be able to detect uh, heterogeneity due to maybe the way that it's distributed or its abundance. Uh, and, and second question is, uh, we previously found um, pretty extensive uh, changes to H3K27 acetylation in response to changing nutrient states. And it was also found in uh, obese mice. And, and part of that we think is because we took islets from mice that had actively been feeding, which was basically means you have to do these experiments at nighttime because they're nocturnal. Um, have you tried anything like that or in um, obese mice where they might be apparently eating during the day um, and lost their normal circadian rhythms to maybe bring out some heterogeneity and histone acetylation? Yeah, okay. Yeah, great two questions, thank you. So the, for the first one, um, it's possible. It's possible that it's due to the nature of the of the mark. Um, these are broad; they're covering the, the gene bodies, so it could be possible. But of course, I, um, it's also um, depending on the antibody. So this is one of the caveats also of this of these uh, uh, projects. It's antibody based. Um, we need to do to take other approaches. We try to do mass spec. It was quite challenging because of the cell numbers. We are still um, trying to work on that. What I can tell you that the, the beta cells have peculiar um, um, results. So they're not as something that was any, any, uh, any time uh, studied in cell lines. Uh, usually 
all the epigenetic states work with cell lines. Um, I submitted the first primary cell to the core facility that did this, and they had what they, they said they never saw it. So I don't know. There is something interesting in these cells. Um, that's what I can tell you from I'm really cautious. Um, but yeah, it's it's possible that okay, the, the narrow marks are just sparse and um, it's hard to detect maybe by high resolution, probably by high resolution. And the K27 trimeter where you have chunk of domains um, that probably are also clustering together uh, to, to cross a certain threshold of, of, uh, of the microscopy uh, link that we have today and allow the identification of these two. And again, these are only four, uh, five marks uh, that we uh, that we analyzed. So it is, and we should do this with cytos, for example, and then just throw a panel um, of, of all the histone modifications and see what we get there. Yeah, and this is also something like in the pipeline, of course. Um, for the second question, that was if we saw any differences in the sarcanine array, I tried that, I tried it, I didn't see any differences. Um, I also tried in vitro to see if we could manipulate just by um, starvation. There we see, we see. So in vitro, when we have very stark um, uh, effect, we see the differences at the K27 chromatin. However, um, I don't see a direct link together with the membranous marker, for example. So I don't know if it's just uh, too strong of a treatment or starvation, for example, in that case, that uh, causes a um, reduction in, in the levels of the nuclear K27 trimetal, but they don't really affect the cell type specification. So this is probably a different um, pathway that is going on. I, that's hard to say, but there is a coupling of, of the mitochondrial uh, uh, function and action and um, the levels of the of K27. So we all know they feed into the they feed into the nuclear the, the chromatin. Met, uh, met, methionine is a byproduct of the mitochondria, right? It will go there and then we'll be able to cover up. I'm sure you know that, of course, from your work. But I didn't see anything uh, circadian linked, um, if that answers your question. I, I was more related to whether um, you can detect changes in other histone modifications when the animals are actively eating or if you have an obese model, because that's yeah. where we found really to affect histone acetylation. Yeah, so I think I know uh, what you're talking about, also nice work. <laughs> Uh, no, but uh, no, I didn't try that. I didn't try other histone marks. Um, and it is challenging on its own. Yeah, we are limited with the, with the marks and with the cell numbers. And um, honestly, I was focused on, on my own uh, uh, line to, to, to finish, but it is a great question and one should, uh, one should try it. We can talk, we can talk, <laughs> let's say. Yeah, let's talk offline, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I have one more question, please, Erez. Um, I noticed on your paper, in your paper, that the ratios of beta high to beta low were much different in the humans compared to the mice. Yeah. Could you just give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, so what we see is, first, first of all, these are human samples, it's highly variable. What we see is, uh, we try to see the correlations, uh, what affects these ratios, and it was the shipment time. Um, what we saw, the longer this, the samples were in, uh, um, in, transient, um, in transit, the more of beta high we saw. So it could be that we have an, just enrichment of the, either these are more um, rigid cells, they are smaller, so maybe they also could, could cope with the, the all, they could also cope with stress better. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but what we do now is, um, I use and uh, freshly fixed all the islets um, back in Alberta. And now we started the, anal the analysis uh, from scratch. So we have each time uh, the people in, uh, at University of Alberta freshly fixed uh, the cells according to our protocol. And then this will be shipped to us for analysis. Um, yeah, then I may be able to give you a better answer. Thank you. Okay, I don't think there's any other questions. Feel free if um, if anyone else has questions, reach out to Dr. Jor offline. Um, thank you again, Dr. Jor, for this. Yeah, thank you. I have the barcode talk. for the LinkedIn or whatever. Oh, yes. If you just yeah, just just message.